about interaction design and emotional well-being. Um, my name is Eleanor Samuelson. I'm an interaction designer and co-founder of The Cocoon. Uh, with The Cocoon, we work with stress resilience and um, well-being at the workplace. Uh, we've created our first product, which is this multi-sensory hanging chair that you sit in for seven minutes to break the cycle of chronic stress. It also puts you in a meditative state to make sure that you feel productive and ready to go um, at work. Uh, my background, um, before this, I was working for a company called Crunchfish. Uh, they do gesture-based technology, so interacting with uh, devices such as iPads or phones or big, large touch screens using your hands. So a lot of spatial interaction. And then we also work with a technology called iBeacon. And that is if you imagine your phone to use Bluetooth to connect with other devices around you. Uh, and with that, we created a lot of different fun things such as playlists and social interactions, splitting the bills and commerce and um, all of that. Before that, I was in New York. I was uh, at Parsons, the new school for design. I uh, studied uh, strategic management, it was called. Uh, focused a lot on participatory design and open innovation. Um, it's a little bit about me. If you guys have any questions or any comments, feel free to interrupt me and just raise your hand and say whatever it is that you would like to say. So emotional well-being, what is this? Um, it's the state that you're in where you feel like you're in balance with your life. You feel like everything is just going well, you're adapting well to society, you enjoy work, um, you feel like you can handle stress. Um, if something happens to you, you can bounce back quickly. Um, and this is a fairly happy and enjoyable state that I would say that most people strive to be in. And as designers, we can create different experiences and interactions that allows us to come back to the state more often than others. The way that I think about emotional well-being is through a balance wheel. There are many ways that you can create this, but for me, this makes sense. Whenever I feel like I'm not balanced, I tend to focus on the different small little habits that I can do. So the way that these balance wheels work is that you start in the middle and you start labeling um, how well you're doing on the wheel. So one is when you're suffering and number 10 is when you're thriving. And you map it out into this uh, little diagram where you can see where you're doing well and where you're doing not so well. And so the idea is that you spend more time and energy on the areas where you're not doing so well. So it starts out with uh, spirituality and a sense of purpose. A lot of people relate this to religion potentially. For me, that is more meditation or yoga practice. It can also be working towards a greater global purpose. So if you're solving a really big world problem, uh, you can feel a sense of purpose in this too. Rest and sleep, it's your ability to take a break, relax, recharge, allow your cells to regenerate yourself. Um, good nutrition and exercise. Um, I'm vegan. I usually eat an anti-inflammatory diet, which means that I don't eat meat, dairy, try to limit sugars and uh, gluten. Not today with the pizza, but otherwise tend to. How often do you see your friends and your family? And how well do you connect to your community? Your work and your financial and your career. Are you fulfilled at work? Do you have enough money to sustain yourself um, in your life? Uh, intellectual stimulation. Um, how much input do you get from an intellectual standpoint? Do you learn and grow every day? Do you feel like you're challenged? Do you feel like you get input from new ideas? And then lastly, creativity and play. That's my favorite one. It's uh, maximizing for fun. And we can use this. And there are many um, solutions out there that help you in either one of these areas. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to cover a few that I found interesting. The first one, it's uh, a smart piggy bank called Earn It. 
Uh, it's made by four Danish fathers. Uh, they created it for their children to kind of help them uh, reach their um, financial goals. So if you think about money as something very intangible, um, they created a way to make it more physical and more relatable so children could understand what happened to this like virtual like money. Um, and then you could save it up for different goals you might have. So if you want to buy a new bicycle, then you could send money to the little piggy bank or save your earnings from that. You could also use it towards charity. And I personally think it's really cute. Um, it makes you smile. They also tell you how much you've saved by giving you some visual cues that you see around the snot um, of the pig. If I find here. So this is showing you just how they're saving up towards like different goals in a pretty fun way. What I use for my intellectual, um, it's an app called Pocket. Um, it lets you save news and articles into an offline stream that you can review later when you have the time to do so. Um, the reason why I like it, it's very convenient. They have a plugin that you can have at Chrome. Uh, they also have it so when you copy a link on your phone and, o and open the app, it just immediately saves. And then you can follow your friends or like different trends that you would like to see more content about. Uh, this is an app that I thought was pretty fun for creativity and play. It's called Bounded. It was made by a Dutch um, orchestra company who uh, wanted to explore movement between two people and explore that interaction and sense of playfulness and see what different kinds of shapes one could create together. Um, if you haven't used it, and I would definitely recommend like downloading it and trying it with a friend, you see on the screen like these this like little game that you play where you need to match the ball to um, to like different shapes. And then you do that together collaboratively. So one thing that I ask myself quite often is how we can use design to tune in with uh, ourselves. Um, one example, it could be using the interactions and the interface uh, to create a sense of like presence, a sense of awareness to slow down and tune in and help the brain to just get rid of all sensory overload and take away some of the information because we're so used to being bombarded by information every day. Uh, two examples that I personally love. The first one here is uh, it's called Here. Uh, I think it may have switched names to Augment right now. Um, but the idea behind it is to use, it's this big moving blob that animates um, in a very watery feeling and it has like different moods to help you cancel out noise so you can better focus in. So talk is for when you want to cancel out the talk around you. There's one for the office where you can cancel out ambient noises. And each of the settings will change colors depending on the different focus area you need to have. So here they're playing with both sound and color to put you in a specific emotional state. Uh, pause, you may know, it's us too, a Malmö-based company. Uh, they're in general pretty great if you want to look more into like health apps and interaction design. They have a lot of different examples. This one is one that I personally like. Um, what you do is you put your finger here and then you follow the circle around and then you it, this blob moves and it tells you to go anywhere. Um, you lose the game by moving too fast and you continue on uh, by moving slow and then this uh, circle will grow bigger as you do. Uh, and it's just a simple way to help you tune in. They created this in collaboration with uh, this guy. 
see if you can hear it. Everything started with my own severe stress and depression, and to the extent I couldn't work. So I've tried everything I could find, but uh, only realized I have to participate in, into my own healing process. Um, so I gave myself six months and practically didn't do anything. But I meditated, I practiced Tai Chi, with the only goal of experience. Using rapid and iterative and it shows a simple action of moving your fingers slowly, gently and continuously on the phone screen. And it rewards you with calming effects when you do so. Keep doing this action will effectively trigger the relaxation response in your body to help you release stress. It also helps you quickly regain focus. And they tested this app um, with uh, this brain wave scanner to see what effect it had on people and found positive results. Um, one can argue if this is as effective as meditation, but it's definitely a good tool to use. Uh, this is our product. It's the Cocoon. Uh, it's designed to help you recharge to feel good uh, for stress resilience. It's this multi-sensory pod that you sit in um, at the workplace. Here it's uh, at Lululemon uh, in New York. They're a yoga brand and they have it in their co-working space. And so for me, what I found really uh, interesting from moving to these digital experiences and like trying to move more and more into the physical is that you actually use quite similar processes when you think. It's just like a different medium or a different spatial experience that you use. So for the cocoon, we were thinking more in terms of what are the sensory inputs that will impact your emotions, your thoughts, um, and your behavior. So in this sense, we wanted people to take a break uh, and relax. So what we're doing is to activate all your senses uh, along different neural pathways. So you enter this state of like, um, meditation. We use uh, these little guys, uh, they're called sound pebbles. They pulsate out sounds as vibrations through your body. And the person can interact with these by putting them on different places on your body uh, that might relieve stress or tension. We've had people with migraines who get in, put it on their forehead and they would be uh, relieved. We've had people with anxiety who said that the cocoon works as well as their strong medication. Um, and some people who just collect stress in their stomach like I do or like their shoulders and it just helps relieve that. Um, we had Fast Company show us, which was pretty exciting. It was like dangling in a rainforest. We're all overworked and we're all over stressed, but one company, Cocoon, believes they can fix that with a seven minute break. So they did a useful or useless video. So we didn't know until after, <laughs> but apparently it was useful. <laughs> the idea is like, I don't go in here and just conk out for half an hour and then go back to work. Yeah, so it's, it's actively designed to actually break the cycle of chronic stress in your brain. So walk me through like, what what is everything here? So there's a smell that's designed to kind of make you feel safe. You probably don't smell it right now, and that's how we want it. You have sound. And the, the sound is kind of the fun part. It's the part that people notice the most because you're hearing it through the headphones, and then you're also feeling it. So you'll be feeling vibrations here and also through uh, throughout your back. So it kind of goes like eight points in your back that are acupressure points. Got it. Now, it sounds like a lot of this is like research-based. Yeah, a lot of it is based on other scientists' research and about 32 different fields of science. You're just going to want to get in? You want to sit in yeah. like right here? So wait, do I, do I take off my shoes? Or do I like you, if you want to take off your shoes, you can. I have mismatching socks. I'm really nice. All right, take your shoes off. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I'm supposed to keep my eyes open. If I close them, what do I do? Um, you're probably going to want to close them. But you'll, whatever feels good, like there's no rules at this after this point. So okay. seven minutes and just enjoy. So what we find interesting right now is that we're really starting to see the trend where like design, technology, and science are starting to merge together more and more. It was like dangling in a rainforest, if that makes sense. It does make sense, and weirdly that's one of the like the biggest responses we get is that people feel like they're in a rainforest or floating down a river. 
it's interesting too because to me it's like you know trying like mindfulness apps or like meditation or any of those things that like it puts a lot of work on the person to do that like it's kind of work to meditate in a way like to get into that zone and this is almost like a, like an assisted bike for meditation or something i feel like so why we keep working on the cocoon like we started doing it more as an experiment to build trust between like veronica and, and i to see if we actually wanted to work together and what's been interesting is um just the feedback we get like the response from people we ask uh, everyone after how it makes them feel to help um iterate it further and also to just see how people resonate with it and um, often we get things that's like I felt like I was in a spaceship traveling around the world or I felt like I was in a jungle finding my community of creatures or I was in the avatar movie or I felt important in my existence and things like that are pretty profound um this is also another project that Veronica and I did. Um, it's um, for the Christmas holiday or for like the holidays. Um, we wanted to create a gift that was not something that you would consume or buy. It was something that would not be permanent. It was something that would last a short amount of time. And what it is, is these small little uh, ornaments that we made from our notes. Um, we made them with um, the cocoon scent and then it came with the cocoon soundtrack. So you could hang them up at home. Um, we also embedded them with these um, wildflower seeds. So once spring came around, uh, yeah, you could meditate with them. Um, we, or you could plant them either in the park or plant them at home and then it would grow wildflowers. And this was a way for us to do something fairly simple and small to just make people more aware of how your lifestyle choices Im impacts the rest of the world and to shift away from consumerism to spending time with one another and doing something that's actually good. Yeah, this is just us being silly. Uh, we also think a lot about how we can use design to help us feel good and how to connect with others. Uh, you're probably all familiar with Headspace, uh, the meditation app. When I first saw their visual uh, identity, I was a little bit surprised because it looked so different from like anything else that you normally see. But now the more and more I've immerse myself in it like you can tell that their purpose with it is just to create the sense of like playful joy and making you feel good through the interactions that they do it's really easy to follow you use it daily so you create that daily habit and if you haven't tried it then definitely try it you you can do i think 10 sessions for free um a bubble monster um that was an app that we did at crunchfish uh, with our beacon technology um we needed to do a showcase app for the developers. Um, and normally those are probably not as exciting, but we were like, let's make it pretty and fun and cute. So the two tasks that we had was we needed to share uh, information and we needed to see what other devices um, were active. So the ones that were alive. So this was your phone. And then as soon as the other ones became active and you could share it to them, they would pop up as little monsters. And then you could feed them pineapples. And it was cute. It was very much liked. And the reason why we did that, it was partly a sales strategy, partly for fun. Um, if you are happy and feel good when you use something, then you tend to like it more. Um, think a lot about how you can connect with others. Uh, this was a game that we made. You're supposed to play it with two people, but it's like a finger twister. So if you know the big twister when you put your feet and hands on top of it, it was like a smaller version that we did uh, during a weekend at, at a gaming hackathon. And what you do is you place your fingers on the screen. The background will change color to denote that it's the other person's turn to play. And then there was also some haptic feedback that would uh, vibrate um, when you did it right or wrong. 
Uh, we started thinking about how you could interact with objects using mul uh, multiple people. So we created this collaborative camera where you had three gestures on the screen. And as you all know, most people don't have three hands. So you had to do it with uh, at least one uh, other person. And um, we used it a lot at, like, as an alternative photo booth. And then the device would broadcast out the photo to everyone who was in the room. Um, which was also fun. Or you could go up with your phone and get it directly by just moving it close. This is another project. Uh, it's an old one we did, but a fun oh, one. On it's uh, a talking mirror. So we placed it in Union Square in New York. And we just set like this little camera behind it. And whenever people walked by, we would give them compliments. Uh, or say something nice to them, or ask them to interact with us. And quite surprisingly, most people did. Like it was, yeah, it was nearly like 80, 90% of like people um, who walked by. Some people even started talking back to the mirror, which was also fun. Uh, we did an, uh, another project with these balloons where we were, we wrote pass a smile and just track them as they moved around like the city. We had this microphone that was just a big, like one of those like megaphones and a little podium where you could stand on top of it and just give compliments to other people. That one people weren't as comfortable with because there was more outgoing, but there were a few people who did it. Um, another way you can think about how you can connect with others is to think about how you can connect with uh, the city that you're in. Um, there is um, a studio in Holland as well, Holland is pretty good with interaction design as you all know, called Studio like Rosengard. They reimagine what life would be if Holland were um, immersed by water and if the sea levels were to rise and how that experience would be. And so really started to experiment out with like how the physical landscape could influence um, our perception of the world and created this very dreamy place where you almost felt like you were immersed in a different world. Another project is by Chris Milk. Um, some of you might know he uh, works with VR right now, but before he do, he started doing that, he created these interactive surfaces where people could stand in front and the screen would augment their movements and they would turn into this, these beautiful birds. Um, they had it at MoMA in New York where I got to experiment with it firsthand. There was also this other project where you could turn into monsters um, and start interacting with strangers in that sense. They're both two quite beautiful ways of how we can start using the physical environments within like cities to create these kind of art pieces that bring people together. Um, if you think about how one can connect with the planet um, I personally think that that has a lot to do with uh, visualizing data and understanding how your interactions has a larger impact. Um, this uh, was a video that I made very long ago. Um, we were told to like visualize the plastic waste from plastic bags in New York. We were working with a company called Grow New York. And so each shape and form that you see is just a representation of a physical object that you can relate to where you can see how your plastic bag consumption affects the planet over your lifetime. And so for one person, that's the weight of a smart car if you live in the Western world or if you live um, in New York. And then we extrapolated this out to if everyone in the world would live like you, then how would that translate? And it turns out that it would fill one um, Mount Everest of trash. And to me, that's a bit scary. And 
So the consumption or this video was to tell people to start using uh, reusable bags instead of the plastic ones. There's another project I really like by the WWF. Um, they uh, show you data on uh, endangered animals uh, around the world. It's quite interactive and fun. Uh, you can click on different species around the world and learn about their natural habitats, learn about their feeding patterns, uh, learn about them like in general and get to know them better and hopefully form an emotional bond. So you might want to help contribute to protect these species either by donating or by um, changing your own habits. Um, and if you look at the emotional well-being and interaction design in the future, um, here, oh, I'm going to share a few things that I think we will see a lot more of, or at least the direction that we aim to head in. Um, I think we're going to reinvent language a lot. Um, so in terms of how we communicate with one another and how we communicate with objects. I think one of the first things that we're al already seeing is here in the top corner, it's um, a smoking, uh, like an anti-smoking um, uh, campaign by the US government where uh, you can text them and they will give you some advice and help on how to like quit smoking and ask you like, how are you feeling? Like, how are you doing? And uh, how is it going to just hold your hand a bit uh, through like a digital advice? Um, we're starting to see more and more like chatbots um, on Facebook. Um, I saw this one app that was really cool where it was actually teaching you to speak in an emotionally intelligent way. Um, this is also something that IBM like Watson is starting to do where it will help you to write like dating messages to whoever you want to pursue. So based on different personality types, it will change your language to what it might be. And um, language is interesting because it's going to move beyond just words and both like, like written and like verbal words. And I think we're going to start interacting in a way that's a lot deeper um, using maybe vibrations, using just different types of scents. I read this book about trees and it says that they communicate by sending out like pheromones to warn the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other trees in the forest if there are like insects that try to bite their leaves and then they start producing toxins to protect themselves. Or they have this very complex uh, root system of fungi that will also help them transport, nu um, transport nutrients to the trees that need it most. So if some trees get more sunlight, they will transport the nutrients to the ones in the forest that are weaker and that might need some nutrients as well. I thought that was pretty beautiful and maybe a way to build cities in the future. We're definitely going to start seeing more like biosignals and like smart walls and like surfaces. Um, this one is Spire. Uh, it's this... Um, a uh, little wearable that you put on your body that will measure your breathing and hence your stress levels. Uh, and it gives you biometric data based on that. Um, these are beacons. Um, we used to work with them a lot when we were at Crunchfish. And it's just these small little stickers that you can place on different objects or surfaces to make them smart uh, to interact with them. But I think in the near future, we're going to start seeing walls being embedded more with technology and soon having technology embedded into our um, biology. Like with the cocoon right now, we're looking into turning these little pods, um, the handheld um, uh, sound pebbles into something that potentially can sense your pulse and your sweat. So we can see how, how stressed you are and how o overwhelmed you are when getting into the cocoon to try to get some biometric data. Um, definitely going to start seeing cities that will become more like this, more organic, more living. Um, we're going to hit a point soon, if we haven't already, where we can replace um, electronic circuits with soft like materials, so like biomaterials. And this here is um, from Singapore. 
uh, they've done a huge experiment uh, out in the harbor area, uh, something called Gardens by the Bay. Uh, their aim was to bring back biodiversity into the city. And they did that by just bringing back plants and nature and then the animals followed. And it's one of their biggest tourist attractions right now because I think human beings are not used to being immersed into nature and life. But I think soon we're going to start seeing more and more greens inside buildings, outside of buildings. I was talking to Skanska the, the other day. They're building a health building called Epic um, over by Studio. And they plan to plant two big trees in, in the center of the building to bring back um, nature. Uh, what's interesting about the Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, they work with organisms so you can bioengineer them to do different types of things. Uh, you can use it for food, you can use it for consumer work, and the idea is down the line that we will be able to design using science, using uh, living like material in the same way that we use yeah, wood or uh, whatever it might be. Um, I think the what most people know about now is trying to cure like chronic diseases, so curing cancer by like replacing certain cells in the body. But this can also be done. Uh, we're thinking about growing cocoons. So instead of building them together, like creating the shape where the cocoon can be grown like like a tree uh, or in a pot at home, um, it will be a couple of years before we're there. But that would be fun. And then finally, um, AI. Uh, I was listening to a really interesting talk. Um, it's a podcast called Future Thinkers. Um, highly recommended. And they were talking about how they believe that the AI in the future will be a very empathetic and like loving uh, creature. Um, because their main argument was that AI doesn't have a body. And so it wouldn't embody like the human fears that we would because it has it's just going to go on living forever and ever and right now we're also reaching a point where humans also could potentially live on forever and ever by just maintaining our same cell structure and keeping that up to date and so their argument was that if we're not as scared of dying then fear becomes irrelevant because fear is based on our fight or flight response like in order to keep our survival going and I personally like that idea instead of the more scary versions that are out there. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you.